Hello everyone, happy Friday, and welcome to another edition of Moments with Mind Leaps. My name is Rebecca Davis, and I'm the Executive Director of Mind Leaps. And many of you know that I say every Friday when we join each other here that this is the, my favorite part of my job right now. Um, what I get to do is speak with some of the most inspiring artists, dancers, researchers, teachers, about the work that they're doing to build their communities at home and around the world. And I leave every Friday feeling like I'm ready to like jump into the air and see what other greatness can happen with the powerful use of the arts. So this week I'm joined by Sue Orkin. Sue is a longtime friend of mine and Mind Leaps and has a really interesting career both as a professional dance movement therapist and as a teacher at Sarah Lawrence College in New York. Uh, she's had the opportunity to travel to Rwanda, uh, done some work with Mind Leaps, and also worked with other organizations and has started some of her own projects in Rwanda, um, really leveraging the power of dance movement therapy about the way it can be used at home and around the world, and especially how it can be taught to young students as they grow up and build their careers. And so I'm so pleased to welcoming Sue to, and to learn more about her work uh, that she's built up from her first degree at UCLA is a Bachelor of Arts and then building around the world. Oh, you look like your summer are beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sitting outside and I couldn't help but share a little bit of nature with my Mind Leaps friends and family. <laughs> I'm immediately jealous. But I, <laughs> I'm very I lucky and very, like very grateful. Uh, you look like you're in a place of serenity and you're ready to tell us how to, to learn about your wonderful work. I'm working on it, Rebecca. <laughs> I'm going to count on you to help me feel relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Sue. Um, we were just remarking together that we're so lucky because this is the second time in two weeks that we've had the chance to talk. And our friends at Mind Leaps in Rwanda are still running around the center <laughs> doing push-ups and saying your name. <laughs> we have to get back to our push-up challenge. <laughs> You're totally going to beat me, Sue. <laughs> so, Sue, um, I know that a lot of your work has revolved around dance movement therapy, but it's much broader than that. Um, both on the mental health side, on the practitioner side, with you and your background as a dancer. Hmm. Share with us a little bit about how you found the arts, how you found dance, and what that's meant to you as you've built a very diverse career. Thank you for your question. Um, truthfully, I think, and without being trite or, uh, you know, kind of poo-pooing, but truthfully, I think it really stems from my experiences as a child. I always... Um, felt my biggest connection to what I was thinking about, my relationships with my friends, my values, my principles, um, my social justice beliefs that began when I was very, very long, very, very young, that it's all oriented in terms of accessing what it felt like in my body. I was always um, much better at communicating non-verbally than verbally and found great resource in connecting empathically with other people, so much so that just really turning inward to see where, where certain thoughts and experiences affected me and to use that information to kind of move forward and navigate my world. It's so eloquent the way that you put it, that you're finding like resource within you to then like extract information to others. Exactly. It's such a, a like a pragmatic way of thinking about the power of the motions of the arts, which you know is sometimes like lofted up into something that's ephemeral, but really it's it's such a, a concrete way to to view and process the world. Well, thank you. I mean, it it it's very easy for us to get lost in the future 
get lost in thoughts or, or worries that we have five steps down the line. And I find that if we can return, whether it's to our breath or the way our musculature feels or noticing our posture or our heart rate, we very simple, concrete tools that link us into um, kind of becoming more aware of where, where we're at and how we can uh, kind of manage what's in front of us. Yeah, when you you talk kind of about like the the actual like anatomy of it and how how we use our bodies, which reminds me of like when I was a kid, my mom was always yelling at me for like having such bad posture, uh -huh. right? She's like, you can't roll your shoulders in like that. But actually, like there was so much more connected to that. Like as as your work alludes to that, it's not just about how you stand, but it's about then the thoughts that trigger up into your mind, and then about how you're able to communicate with others. It's, it's, it's like maybe starts with like the rounded shoulders. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think that the reason she wanted me to change was probably more than just that. <laughs> and I, exactly. And I also felt things so deeply in my body. And sometimes that's a blessing. I don't say it's a curse, but sometimes it's a blessing and sometimes it's a challenge. So I, I've, I've been often told that I'm very sensitive or very, I'm very emotional or I'm an empath and, you know, words that are hard to kind of absorb, honestly. Um, but I think the older I get, the more apologetic I feel. And um, the more I'm able to use the resources that I have, not only in my own life, but in my work and um, the different opportunities I have to uh, share this type of world with others. Uh, the, the, I just love the way that you, you talk about it as like resources and the, the way that we can use these these things. It's really like a toolkit that we can we can harness. And I know your work is is doing so much around that uh, from your work at Sarah Lawrence, but then also I know you've worked in Rwanda uh, with different communities and you've built various projects across the United States. Maybe you could highlight for us a couple of those like professional experiences where you're really like fusing these ideas about how to use our resources and then you see the impact that it has on those around you? That's a big question, Rebecca. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. Um, you're a professor, Sue. All right, all right. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the bulk of my career, I would say since until the last five to seven years. I worked in many, many different mental health care settings throughout New Jersey, where I'm living right now. Um, primarily hospitals, working with children and adolescents with challenges with mental health, working with children and adolescents with cancer, with serious blood disorders at the end of life, uh, adults with developmental disabilities, along the way I became very interested in also becoming a yoga teacher. I became a dancer and therapist that when I lived in Baltimore, I went to Goucher College many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> um, and then more recently had an opportunity to join the faculty and staff at Sarah Lawrence College, um, where I'm teaching in the graduate school there, dance movement therapy, the theory and practice of dance movement therapy. And along the way, I met someone that we know in common who said, you have to meet Rebecca Davis and go to Rwanda and, and meet those kids in Mind Leaps. So that was in 2018, um, right? 2018. And I fell in love with Rwanda. Literally, I fell in love with Rwanda. I felt like in so many ways I was coming home. And I think the... I, I, I tried to reflect on that and to try to understand that for myself. What in particular was I feeling again so deeply in my body? And I think there's a sense of um, the Rwandan people and culture know the body better than any of us. So, uh, and I felt that and then was able to experience that right away. Um, I think that comes from resilience I think that comes from such a strong priority of community and connectedness. 
um, and the beautiful history of dance in Rwanda and its place in so many aspects of everyday life and relationship. Um, so after that trip, um, I did a lot of soul searching and then and because of that trip, met many people who are also involved with Avega, which is an organization in Rwanda, as you know, and addressing and um, providing support to members, thousands and thousands of members who are survivors of the genocide. Um, and one thing led to the next, and here we are, lifelong partners working together on body level um, in body shared body level strategies, whether it's breathing or meditation, dance movement therapy, um, guided imagery, progressive relaxation, and then busting out in African dance. You know, so it's all been a shared collaboration. Um, all of our materials have been um, uh, translated in Kenya, Rwanda, and Evelyn who is a big part of my leaps and I, he's going to be my new Kenya Rwanda teacher. <laughs> so I'm so excited. So did I answer your question? Well, uh, did I answer your question? Oh, beautifully. Okay. beautifully. I, I could just keep sitting and listening and forget to ask you another question. <laughs> um, Avega is like such a wonderful organization working in Rwanda that is really trying to figure out how do you rebuild lives after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. And uh, Sue, I was so excited to hear when you had connected to them and started a permanent program because uh, I've known the organization for a long time. I've heard just incredible stories from these women and always kind of wondered what is kind of that mental health piece of it. Um, and, and people had all, often ask me and I was like, I have no idea, but it's really, really wonderful to see how those pieces are starting to be sewn together. Yeah. And, and Sue, so I wonder for, for those of us who, who hear these terms thrown around a lot, but don't really have like maybe um, the, the pedagogy in it, you share with us a little bit, like what is like sure. dance movement therapy is often kind of tossed into the mix of things, but it's something very, very specific. It help us understand like really dance movement therapy and the narrowness of that. Well, <laughs> As a profession, we are um, grappling with the fact that dance movement therapy has been a, a long, uh, around long, 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 long before dance movement therapy came around. And what I mean by that <laughs> is the profession, as it's established in various healthcare settings, educational settings, and so on, as a professional discipline, began in around the 1940s when earlier early psychological theorists start to started to recognize that the body and nonverbal communication is a big part of health and wellness and uh, a small group at the time developed that profession and kind of grew it to what it is today and now today we have the responsibility to keep returning back to indigenous global dance um, uh, healing dance, ritual dance, um, so that as we grow the profession, we, we, um, we embrace the elements that um, we need not forget. Um, so dance movement therapy in the United States, it's also practiced internationally. There are programs in many, many, many countries. It's associated with a particular organization with standards and ethics and um, particular educational training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, Sue, it's like wonderful to hear the way you describe it because I think often we just kind of get that definition about, yes, it's, you know, it's a particular curriculum. And, but here you give it really kind of the context of understanding where it came from and, and the responsibility to integrate that history in it now. And then also how it is so codified and so international mm -hmm. in its use. Thank you. Well, <laughs> oh, I feel like I needed to ask you that question two years ago. So thank that, you. That's so beautifully. Really I want to remember that. what you said too. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have lots of notes after this one, Sue. <laughs> 
Um, and you should know that Olivier, who's from Team Rwanda, is saying hello to you. And Olivier has also asked me the question I just asked. Oh, so hi, I Olivier. I remember him. <laughs> Uh, so, Sue, you, you speak about this work that you're doing in Rwanda, and we would love to hear more about it, and also kind of the, the wonderful connection that, that you felt when you first came to the country. Now, as you've come back and forth between the United States and Rwanda, can you share with us like a memory that stands out, a story, a person that helps us kind of make the abstract into to something really tangible? In I know it's impossible I know. to ask you it, to it's, do that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, there, there are, if I were to truthfully answer the question, but I don't want to be too vague, I would say every moment, and I really mean that because there's something about the Rwandan people that drew my heart in every single moment that I was there. But I'm going to be more specific. I'm going to be disciplined. <laughs> um, last January 2020, um, I had an amazing privilege to bring my boss at Sarah Lawrence, five students, and my friend who I met when we um, studied Reiki together, Healing Touch. Oh, wow. And yeah. um, we, we partnered with about 150 people who all came to our program. And, and the program, the collabor collabor collaborative program, is called e-stress holistically, where we shared and practiced and, and people trained each other in these various strategies that I was talking about. And there was a member, um, I would say a man maybe in his mid thirties, early forties, who had one week prior lost his wife at childbirth. And oh. his, um partner in a vega said it's up to you your loss is raw but maybe you would like to come with me to the program and they were buddies they were each other's buddies the entire four days and at the end of the program um all the members had gotten together, made a few donations to his family, wrote cards, shared prayers, shared blessings. And he said, I found coming to this program healing. If I didn't have the opportunity to be in my body and to be with my friends and to express myself, I think I would have been in a, in a bad way. I don't remember his exact words. And the shared experience of dancing together, being creative together, laughing together, finding discoveries together was so enlivening that it in and of itself was um, incredible to his healing. It, it, was, it was profound. Oh, this is like one of the best stories I've heard in a long time, Sue. The way that, that you really um, help us understand like the power of that word healing, right? And how it can connect to what you've been, been sharing with us earlier, this idea of using our resources. And yes, it's emotional, it's all of these things, but it's really something quite profound and something that can be, that can really be melded yeah. into to this really important outcome that's beyond aesthetic and beyond beauty. Exactly. and it's, yeah. it's so empowering we we meet in the world of the nonverbal, like the expression as it takes takes its own life it really it it, it was phenomenal uh, thank you so much for you're sharing welcome that, um and and maybe there's uh, there's some secrets in there that you can share for us when we look at the world right now and we often feel like we need a lot of healing <laughs> and we need to figure out what, how to make sense of all of these things. Um, with COVID, I know for all of, uh, all of our friends in higher learning, it's had a, a huge impact on, on the way that you're able to, to teach students, on the way that you're able to, 
to embed this craft in the next generation, but also um, with the, the greater Black Lives Matter movement, especially in our country, but around the world. I know you've been really giving deep thought to all of these things, especially as how it relates to your work. What are, what are some, some findings and reflections that you can use to help all of us to, to make the world a better place? Mm. Good gracious. <laughs> um. I don't get to talk to you all the time. I know, I know. I, I need all your wisdom. <laughs> well, in our country, we are not, we don't live as a shared community. We're divisive. We're unkind. We don't get curious about difference. We have a very hard time finding compassion. And I would have wished in my heart of hearts that when something came around like a pandemic that not only affects this country, affects our entire world, that we could um, remember again and again that we have a shared experience. Shared experience to me is a huge part of my teaching, my um, my lifestyle um now more than ever black lives matter black lives have always mattered but historically we we sustain racism beyond beyond words it, it's shameful and so i guess if i were to uh abbreviate, I would suggest to remember to be in our bodies, to remember to um, be interested and curious about what we share and how we're different, and to, to have the courage to take careful look, especially as a white woman of privilege, to do the self-study necessary to really create change. Uh, thank you so much, Sue. Uh, I was in a, a session yesterday from the Siegel Family Foundation, and all of these ideas that, that you're raising were really at the, the forefront of this conference to try to figure out how do these shared experiences, if they've been forgotten or if they haven't been created enough, how do we generate those and how do we uh, uplift those to make sure that the decisions are made correctly, no matter who's at the table. Um, and I, I wish somehow there, there could be a, a deeper connection between how you talk about the, the place of the body and the place of understanding things from the inside, I think needs to somehow go into that, that big uh, kind of macro level conversation for us to not get lost. In theory. And the, the point is, there's a lot of theory and research that trauma and chronic stress can only be worked through the body. So let's get on with it. And the other day, by the way, I, it, was, it was truthfully after the debate here in the United States, I texted my Rwandan friends and you know what I said? I said, will you please pray for our country? And I was serious. I was serious because we need it. And if anyone's prayers could make a difference, it's prayers coming from Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, Sue! I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if we'll be able to make it through this interview without crying. <laughs> Look who's talking! What about me? I, when I, when I was in my league, I might you, I should have stopped crying. crying. <laughs> oh well, I accept it. <laughs> We'll go between crying and push-ups, but it's all about the body in the end. <laughs> so, uh, Sue, in the last few minutes that we have together, um, sh please, um, with your, with all the young people that you see um, going through Sarah Lawrence, and they have a chance to learn and study from you, and then the generation after that that's trying to figure out you know, what can they do with the arts, how can they build these careers, how can they connect healing and dance 
uh, like these these younger artists i see them trying to you know figure out these pieces in their heads like what kind of advice could you give to to this next generation about building careers building experiences like like you've done so masterfully well well that's a big question because a lot of it is governed by access and privilege let's be straight about that Having said that, if there is a young person who feels that experience of creativity and expression and release and some inherent ideas about um, what it means to experience artistic expression and creation and, and its um, impact on potential healing or well-being, I would suggest find one person to talk to who wants to hear your story. One, doesn't have to be someone with a connection. That would be great. Or, you know, that, but <laughs> just talk. Share what you feel. Share what brings you passion. And see where that story can lead to the next story, the next connection, and the next. Don't keep it a secret. We, we need young people like this to rise to this creative, artistic, shared experience challenge. Oh, beautifully <laughs> put. Uh, Sue, I'm, I'm going to take all of my, my quotes for next year from the, this Oh, interview. now, come on. But don't worry, that. I'll take them. <laughs> this is, this is my necklace from the Kigali Museum. The Kigali Memorial oh, wow. Museum. Wait a minute. This way. Can you see it? <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. I have to look up again its um, symbolism. Okay. Well, well, when you look it up, we'll add it in the notes to this interview okay. because everybody's going to be okay. asking us. Will do. So you, you've started the session by talking to, to us about resources and how we can really kind of think about the power of what's inside mm. us and how that's touched you. Uh, and also the, the shared experiences and how that's a part of understanding or processing our world today. Uh, th there's so much that, that I appreciate from what you share with me, what you share with Mind Leaps, what you share with our students. And I'm so jealous of your students at Sarah Lawrence <laughs> that they get to work with you all the time. Um, I'm so Thank grateful you. for the time that you spent with us and the, the thoughts that you've shared with us today. I just wish I could give you a big uh, hug right I, I, It's been really, really my honor. And I'm going to try to do a heart like Bashir. Oh, okay. I'll do my heart like Evelyn. Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh. Sue, thank you so thank much. You. Stay strong. You stay too. Safe. You I too. And don't forget your body, ever. That's what we'll sign off with. Don't forget Don't your, forget body, your ever. body ever. Thank you. Bye.